Dzień dobry Państwu. Teraz się słyszę. Good morning, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen. For some people it was a dream, for other people it was just everyday life. For all of us it was an inspiration. For two decades it remained the direction for Polish changes. It mobilized us to transform ourselves politically, economically and to modernize the country. Many of us felt joy and pride when the flag was being drawn up in 2004. And for many years there were very many supporters and uh, very many supporters that were unconditional. More Europe. The more Europe we had, the more it seemed we needed Europe. Today it has become the place of uncertainty. Many have declared it a source of threats even, rather than the promised land. Its flag appears to some as a vulgar gadget. Even those who have been awarded by the EU, by the European Union, uh, seem sometimes to doubt the attractiveness and they convince others to be skeptical about Europe. Even those who followed the, found, the founding fathers seem to be more, more skeptical these days. What has happened? to Europe, what has happened to EU, what has happened to EU's faith and trust in the European Union, how to find it anew. These are the topics and the questions for today's debate. Krzysztof Blusz, I'm a European, I'm a Pole, and we have Sylvie Kaufmann, Jan Zielonka, and Ivan Kastev with us. The persons that I actually don't need to introduce to you. But all of them share something. Ivan wrote recently about himself, and I'll, I'll try to do a site translation of, of it. I'm not a specialist in integration. I'm an expert, but uh, an expert in disintegration. I know how things collapse. That is what I studied all throughout my life. I worked on the Balkans, and I know how the Balkans collapse. And before then, I had studied the Soviet Union that also collapsed. Jan Zielonka, for many years, has been looking closely at, at empires, also the European empire. And he has been wondering about whether Europe is destined to fall or not. Sylvie Kaufmann was, uh, has been rewarded very many times for a cycle of her uh, documentaries and uh, articles about the empire struck on the 11th of September. And this is the best intellectual capital within a few thousand kilometers radius that we can use today in order to ask a few central questions. English, so please do use your headphones and I'll keep going in English for the next uh, at least 45 minutes to save you these changes of modes between Polish and English. Has Europe already abdicated or has been made to abdicate from its European dream? What is it all about? Is the crisis which we have been experiencing other than other crises in the world? What is it all about? Um, Euro crisis, immigration, low or non growth unemployment, terrorism, rise of inequalities, anxiety over European social model, democratic deficits, rebellion against elites and institutions. Is this a crisis of Europe? Is this a crisis of democracy? Is this a crisis of liberalism? Is this a crisis of capitalism? What are we dealing with and how do we get out of it? And I will start with Ivan giving you the floor for the next five minutes. Listen, I, I, I'm not going to be on the dream side because normally when people are dreaming, they're sleeping. Uh, uh, but uh, I'll try to, uh, to make uh, three points which particularly for, for me looks quite important in uh, the way we're trying to see what is going on. 
And one is very much based on this type of uh, uh, disintegration expertise of mine. Imagine a couple that have a difficult times. Does it make a difference if one of the partners has had a divorce before? I'm saying this because one of the major difference between Eastern Europe and Western Europe is that all of us, in our personal experience, and it has nothing to do with values or interests, have seen how a political system that was perceived as stable and fair, awful but quite stable, collapsed overnight. And I do believe that this experience is quite important, and unfortunately, I do believe this is one of the totally undiscussed risks about the behavior of Central and Eastern Europe in the time of the European crisis. Uh, it is well known that if something wrong going with, goes with the European Union, East European countries, all of them, are going to be the biggest losers, both in economic and political, but also in security terms. Uh, this was very much discussed. But exactly because of the fact that we have gone through a type of personal experience of disintegration, what I'm very much afraid is the power of the deja vu. You see certain things, and you have this feeling, come on, I have seen this before. I have seen how this does not work, how that does not work, and imagine what is the situation in places like Slovenia or Croatia or the Baltic Republics, which see simply basically also disintegration of the state. And as a result of it, I do believe that one of the risks is that our governments, and to be honest, it does not depend very much also even on the political profile of the government, can choose a policy in which they're going to hedge, which means they're trying to go with the policies which they do believe are going to be optimal. Nevertheless, East European Union is going to do well, or is the European Union going to fail? Unfortunately, this type of policies also escalates the crisis itself. Uh, my second point has to do with another type of uh, event, because I very much believe in events. And this is the British referendum. And this is going, in my view, to have a very strong consequences, nevertheless, how it turns out. If it goes bad, psychologically, this feeling that something is wrong with Europe and we have a reverse of the historical trend that we have before is going to be very much there. But if, and I hope this is going to be the case, United Kingdom votes for staying, there are going to be one unintended consequence of this success that is less discussed. And this is the proliferation of the referendum. Many people all over Europe will try to go for a referendum in order to have a final say in this anxiety. There was a study being done by Ipsos just 10, years, uh, 10 days ago, which shows that uh, in eight big uh, European countries that have been polled, majority of the population believes that they also want a referendum on uh, European Union. Many of them not because they want to leave, but basically now having a referendum on the Union is perceived as a status issue. If you, don't have, if you don't give people the say, you're not respecting them. Why I'm saying this, the problem with the referendum is that if you want to basically commit a suicide as a political union, put a referendum on the table. First, you never know how it's going to work. On what people are voting on the referendums is something, and there is a lot of studies in political science on this, very difficult. But secondly, uh, the very fact that you come with the idea of the referendum on the European Union destroys one of the major assumptions behind the project. Because in a strange way, European Union is a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's not by accident that there was no exit option for the Euro. The idea was done that basically, this is like nature. This is not something that should seriously be discussed. At the moment when the alternative of a disintegration is perceived as a legitimate alternative, it changes very much the way of discussion, and you can basically see the British discussion, how much it, uh, it worked. And my last and third point, which I want to, uh, to make, is uh, with the impact of the refugee crisis. And the impact of the refugee crisis in the East-West relations uh, is the reasons why we basically behaved in the way we behaved is easy to be explained. But there is one major macro change that came as a result of this crisis. Uh, if you go back to the opinion polls about the East European support uh, for European Union over the last 10 years, you're going to see that East Europeans, unlike West Europeans, uh, tend to trust Brussels more than they trusted their own governments. And being Bulgarian, I know the logic. The logic is, listen, we don't know what these people in Brussels are doing, but they cannot be worse than ours. 
the fact that we know our own governments and we mistrust them was one of the reasons that we trust Brussels, because people believe that Brussels is an ally of the people basically to constrain their own elites. As a result of the crisis, first, people started to believe that the Brussels is an ally and not constrained to these elites. And secondly, that nevertheless, how bad our national governments are. When it comes to sensitive issues like refugees, they're going to take much more care for you than these people in Brussels. Uh, and I do believe this is a major change uh, because to a great extent, the leverage of the European Commission over these European societies was very much based on this asymmetry of trust which now has changed. Jan, you have been long time predicting that benign policies and negligence of the European elites would cause a trouble. Are we just in the midst of it now? Is this a question you have put into your book as the doom to failure just materializing in front of our eyes right now? You know, when I was promoting my book, a lot of people were always asking, how come that, that did you ask this very provocative question, is, is the EU doomed? And I was trying to give them academic answer, which was, you know, I just I look at the evidence that this is what I came from. Now, I have much more convincing answer to these questions after uh, Ivan's intervention because I meet all the criteria of people who would understand what failure means. I'm both divorced and I come from the Union, <laughs> the Soviet Union part, you know, which <laughs> collapsed and we swapped it for something else. But uh, most seriously, it, you see, it, my, I was always European and I'm European par excellence, you know, uh, if you look at, at my curriculum and identities. Uh, and the story, uh, so it doesn't come to me naturally, despite my, uh, you know, uh, experience with divorces. But, uh, but you see, problems like this emerged when parties are unable to reconcile differences and they are unable to change. They promise we always will change, but, but they never do. They stick to the bad habits. And funny enough, if you look at personal uh, divorces, these days, uh, the age cohort you know, of people divorcing is usually over 60. Um, and, and I think this is the major problem. The union was very successful, but at a certain moment, it, it, it was unable to adjust to change. If you ask me when was the last reform, profound reform the Union attempted and frankly failed, was the Constitution project. And since then we only had a fiscal compact which is a symbol of imposition by Mercosi duo, duo on others. And it's just basically unworkable and everybody knows it. I mean, we have been applying aspirin to various serious challenges we faced. And I'm a great fan of aspirin, especially if I have too much Chianti the day before. But you know, some... Uh, this time it wasn't about Chianti the day before. Some uh, problems required a serious treatment. And, and problems are bound, you see, and, and here we shouldn't blame union for everything which goes wrong in our life. Uh, I certainly don't blame the union for my divorce. But, uh, but it's obviously uh, that, that the crisis of democracy and capitalism is this in the Western world cannot be just solved by the EU. I mean, uh, hadn't we had all other problems on our hands, we probably would be able to fix it. But we have them. But what we can do is basically think differently about the way we can work in Europe with each other because uh, we are kind of so independent and condemned to each other that we have no other option. And I don't believe in the options that we take our toys to the nation state and everything will be fine. Because I happen to work with Alan Milward who, 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 who made these famous studies that integration rescues nation states rather than uh, uh, incapacitated them. So if you believe that you will have to 
uh, you know, integrate, and we have to do it uh, differently in different times because uh, the world has changed, you know. Since we had last reform of the Union, which is the Maastricht Treaty, we, we had geopolitical revolution in Eastern Europe. We had globalization revolutions, which in partly, you know, uh, orchestrated by the single market project. And we had internet revolution. I mean, uh, democracy cannot work uh, in, in the 21st century as it worked, you know, in, in the pap papyrus age. And the same applies to, to, to our integration model. And the only we s thing we see from those who, who are at the helm of Europe is, like Mr. Tusk, keeps repeating time and again, if you have a vision, go to a doctor. I mean, what kind of a leader he is? Or I'm even more angry when I hear Mr. Juncker who says, you know, we know what should be done, but if we would do this, we would be voted out of office. I mean, in democracy, interest are public interest. They have to be ne negotiated with the public by elites on, on, on a regular basis. And we don't have mechanisms in Europe to do this. And I fully agree, and here I stop with, with Ivan, that, that the referenda is just, not just the least intelligent way of, 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 of making decisions, but it's a conflict maximizing decision. Well, you've written the that there's a festival of populism. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I wrote just a, a blog on, on, on this. You know, in Britain, it, it, it was promised to be a festival of democracy. It proved to be an exercise in, in political madness. But, but it is the nature of referendum, because the winner takes it all. There is no space for compromise. There is no space for negotiation. Nothing. Yeah. Well, again, let, let's stop in here. I, I just want to go to Sylvie now, because, you know, Sylvie, you, 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 you were here where we were kicking off our transformation. You still remember the 4th of June of 1989. Um, and over the the last 25 years, you have been carefully following what's been happening in this part of Europe. And very recently, you brought back Istvan Bibo's notion of collective neurosis describing what's been going on in Visegrad countries. 25 years after the Visegrad uh, uh, summit, we have a situation where the V4 countries seem to identify a new enemy in Brussels instead of the old enemies in the east and in the north of the continent. What's been going on in your eyes in here? And then if I may already throw at you one more thing, uh, sparked by the most recent events in Austria in the run-up to the elections, you were warning that this is something which we really need to take seriously because this is the warning for the West, because Austria was not a new Europe. Austria is a part of the old Europe. What, what is the dynamic unfolding in front of our eyes in your view? Um, you mentioned uh, June 4th, 1989, and it's true, it, um, I was here and I would like to uh, spend a little bit of time on that memory because it is, uh, it was a, a watershed. Uh, day. Um, everybody remembers the Berlin Wall, the fall of the Berlin Wall, but uh, <clears throat> June 4th, you know, it started, it was a very bright day uh, as, as today, and it started as, uh, um, you know, the, 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 the round table and then the campaign. All this was not a glamorous event, it was um, uh, a process, it was cumbersome, it was painstaking, it was difficult. Uh, and June 4th was the, a, a day like this. Uh, you know, people were voting, it was not spectacular, it was, but June 5, <laughs> uh, early morning, I, I work for a paper which was um, an, an evening newspaper then, so that meant I had to file early in the morning. So June 5, at 6 a.m., I was, I went to Platz Constituzzi, uh, where this cafe, Niespojanka was, where the Solidarity head, Electoral Headquarters was, and you had those guys, there was a big blackboard in front of the door where I think now is this, this orange um, uh, store. And, um, 
and you know they were just adding numbers. And by 6 a.m. probably, it became clear that there was a landslide for solidarity. And you're talking about dream. Um, that was a dream come true, really. It was, you know, it was such a contrast with that cumbersome effort of building this um, this semi-free election uh, campaign. Um, you know, this newspaper Gazeta Viborcia, which was born, I think, one month earlier, to support this campaign. And suddenly, you know, the king was. How do you say naked? The, um, your white, your white new, yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, it became obvious that democracy had won, that uh, communism was defeated. It was not overnight. You know, it was going to be another process, but the truth was there, very clear, very simple, and. Um, Several years later, uh, Poland and other countries joined the EU. Um, I mean, there was NATO first, and then this, there was um, um, e uh, European Union membership. All these, the, the goal of those uh, memberships were also very clear. Um, I remember a, a friend telling me on the day these countries were admitted into the EU, now I'm European and my children are European. And we both understood very well what it meant to be European in those days. Now, 25 to um, a little bit more, 27 years later, we don't know what it means anymore. And the countries whose populations were so um, happy and you know, didn't really ask themselves so many questions about what it meant, it just wanted to, to do it, now are at the forefront of the rebellion. As you said, you know, there's a, a, again this, I mean, as Istvan Bibo said, wrote um, several decades ago, uh, there's again this um, neurotic anxiety and um, the anxiety of small states, of being swallowed. Uh, and even worse, we find <laughs> sometimes Brussels being compared either to Hitler by <laughs> this uh, fantastic uh, Boris Johnson in London or to the Soviet, to Moscow in the Soviet times, which I mean both are of course completely crazy comparisons, but the fact that they come to a politician's mind is very uh, revealing. Uh, so one thing, you know, the dream is still somewhere. The dream, look at Maidan, uh, for people on Maidan, and that was a, a, another very powerful movement for people on Maidan in 2013, 2014, the dream was Europe, the flag. Um, again, you know, joining a community of values uh, of democratic countries. So the dream is still there somewhere, but it's outside uh, the European Union. It's not with us. Anymore. Yeah, inside the dream um, uh, has evaporated. Mm, and so we, I think in that respect, we have lost, the European Union has lost the, what the, the Americans call the battle for hearts and minds, definitely. Uh, and today, um, you know, the, the EU, um, um, EU members only have a ut utilitary vision of, of the Union. Uh, the, the Brussels is seen as a way of pushing uh, a member state's interest without having to fight a war, basically. This is what Brussels is for, this is what the Union is for. It's a big lobby. Um, and I think only the founding members still have a sense of uh, the common good, which represented originally the European Union, uh, and but the sense of solidarity generally is lost. So uh, I think this, you know, this is the, the the observations we can make. Why did it happen? Um, of course, there are many. Um, reasons which have been, you know, all those revolutions that uh, Jan has uh, mentioned and the, the structural problems that the European Union has uh, to solve these problems or to confront them. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I don't want us to, con con to focus too long on the crisis and the, the roots of the situation we are in. But let me let me ask you one more question on, on the on the last uh, uh, piece of, of your intervention. You said that the funding members seem these days to be the ones who really fill it, and and you have written something about this, saying that you know, given all the benefits the countries of Central Europe uh, were actually granted by the old members, but the old members did not push enough for the uh, preservation and implementation of the standards and the core values of the European, uh, whatever we call it, political heritage, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. is, is this something which you see as a core element of the East-West divide re-emerging now. Is this something new or this goes back to a rather... Uh... I, I think the founding members had their, origin, their own motivations for building the Union. Uh, of course, that was, you know, post-World War II. Uh, there's the French-German engine, of course, which was uh, crucial in, in, in this uh, construction. And, and the, the, the enlargement uh, decades later uh, answers a completely different dynamic. It's different. It was, uh, you know, it was the fall of uh, the Soviet bloc, uh, the fall of com the collapse of communism, not only of the ideology but also uh, of of the org international organization of Europe. Um, so, you know, it's. I think the found, I, when I say the founding members still have the feeling of the common good. Um, it, it's more a subjective feeling that I have because I live in, uh, you know, I'm French and, and um, I can see that also in the French-German relation there is this still very strong bind uh, that we have to stay together in this within an organization which is the European Union. But of course the relation to the newer members is different and it has to be treated differently. So we have to, I think we haven't paid enough attention to these different rationales that uh, unite us or you know, don't unite us strongly enough. And, and we have to address them. We have to address the concerns of these Central European states. Um, they have gone through different um, uh, histories in the in the second part of the uh, 20th century. I think we haven't gone deep enough in the consequences of the fall of communism. Um, you know, this is a new experiment. These democracies uh, being built after um, decades of communism. This is unprecedented. We thought it would just, you know, you just had to uh, adopt a model, but obviously it's much more complicated than this. Thank you, Sylvie. I, I, I see both, both gentlemen wanted to intervene. Advocate Jan comes first on this. No, I just, I just think this is uh, one of those mythologies on, 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 on founding father unity or solidarity. I mean, had France and Germany reach an agreement how to proceed with integration. They could do this and others would, would follow, but they have never done it and they are less likely to do it today than before, simply because after the end of Cold War we had German unifications and size matters here. And France is not so central to, to decision making. If you want to arrange anything in Europe, you don't go to Brussels, uh, uh, certainly not to Paris, you go to Berlin uh, and that's life. Uh, but uh, but it, it's also another scores, you know. The Dutch might be together with Belgians funding fathers, but they don't really work with each other. They, they despise each other. Mm -hmm. uh, I can tell you stories uh, from my, my Dutch uh, uh, period. And, uh, and Italy, which is now very busy organizing meetings of funding the fathers, fathers. Mm -hmm. you see, it, it, it basically tries and to, to, to press Germany to a totally different course. And, and, and they are on, 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 on a collision course. Uh, uh, so, you see, it's always, you know, a lot of those things is, 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 is kind of to Orientalist, so to speak, you know. <laughs> uh, let's face it, I mean, the, the Union never confronted Berlusconi and his, his media empire 
um, uh, but, but was first immediately to, to, to confront uh, some Central Eastern European country. Rightly so, but there is a selective here attitude to this. But the problem here is not that we are different, because life is about managing differences. The problem is that this model of integration, Surgenalis. led by, member, by nation states, it reaches its limit, that they are unable to, to go a step further and to transfer power to the European Centre, because it would mean collective suicides of states, basically, if this would be for real and not. And they are unable to go back. They, they are like this bank, which is too large to fail, and nobody knows how, what to do with it. And let's, let's stop in here, because this is exactly the, the um, uh, subject of our discussion in the, in the second round of questions, but I want to give uh, Ivan a chance to react. Are we, are we, are we different? Yeah. No, no, but listen, w when we came to difference, we basically are in the Lady Gaga area. Uh, and this is quite important, but I do believe that there is one structural difference between East and West that should be taken slightly more serious. Basically, European integration in the West came as a result of the failure of the nation states. It was an alliance of defeated. And it's not by accident that the United Kingdom, which was the victorious power during the war, didn't join the founding fathers. So from this point of view, internationalism come very naturally to the political elites exactly because of the failure of the national states. In Central and Eastern Europe, the end of the communism was the end of one form of internationalist regime which was replaced by another, which was European integration. So the dream for sovereign, traditional nation state was always there. It was not expressed, it didn't basically win the elections, but it was very much present. And at the moment when the European crisis started, you can see it back. Honestly speaking, metaphorically, I do believe that the best way to think about some of the new governments that we have in the region today is to think like a second generation of migrants. The first generation do all their best to be better Europeans than Europeans. You have Havel and Geremex of Central and Eastern Europe. For them, integration was very much show that we can be even better Europeans than you. But then even the second generation of immigration always come with the problem of identity, the problem of being treated as a second class of a citizen. And there is something quite important that, and this is why I do believe that the crisis of the EU is going to be a major reconsideration of the whole period after 1989, not only in the East, but also in the West. Because there was one important assumption behind the end of the history story, which turns to be wrong. And the idea was that the West is going to change the world, but the West itself is not going to be changed. And we saw that this is not how it worked. Uh, and all this idea of uh, the end of history perceived as the age of imitation, where the others simply are going to imitate Western models, Western norms, turned to be problematic. And even successful imitations, to be honest, this is the problem of Europe with Poland. In Hungary, you can dislike what you see, but you can see also what the previous government has left. And it was a totally ruined country. The problem with Poland is why somebody who, at least in the eyes of Europeans, was so successful that decided basically to make these choices. And my major argument will be imitation, even when it is successful, creates resentment. Because imitation is always a symmetrical relationship. It's a power relationship. It's always others to tell you how successful you are or not. And then basically you get what you're getting. Ivan, thank you. Before we move on with our second uh, part of the discussion, let me just remind uh, our guests and the audience that in 10, 15 minutes we will open up for a more interactive discussion, so please do think about the toughest questions you may have and the most controversial comments and polemics you can come up with, so uh, bear, bear, bear with us uh, for the next 10, 15 minutes. And obviously I want to go back to the issue which, which was actually touched upon and alluded to uh, by all three of our guests. Uh, speakers today, uh, the, the, the issue of, of where do we look for faith in the European Union and possible sources of its rejuvenation, if at all. Uh, Jan uh, was mentioning the other, other ways, alternative ways of, of integrating. My question actually is, you know, we, we used to 
to look for legitimacy in the EU, either referring to the fear of war, which has re-emerged very recently uh, in, in the British debate. Um, we have been recently looking very much into all those cravings for participation. Ivan has written that actually rebellion against elites and Jan, that was also Jan's argument, rebellions uh, against elites uh, would be the key undermining factor in the whole equation. Um, during the most severe phase of the economic crisis, we were very much thinking about drawing on desires to be prosperous again as the driver of, of rejuvenation. Uh, and then there is this issue and the specter of, of the sovereign state at Europe, of the sovereign state's uh, almost Westphalian way, uh, sort of a haunting uh, many European countries now. Um, is, is there a way we could get out of this binary logic of, of the sovereign state versus federal Europe? Even Donald Tusk, to whom I alluded in my intro very recently uh, at the APP celebration, said that we finally need to give up upon all those utopias, a utopia of Europe without nation states, a utopia of Europe without conflicting interests and ambitions, a utopia of Europe imposing its own values on the external world. Uh, is, there, is there a way we could basically give up upon the illusion of what we share and instead we draw on the la différence, if I may use the French words, with all its consequences? Can we build our strength out of our differences? Even you start first. Uh, let's start with the obvious. Uh, there was four famous pillars of the European unity, which everybody was always quoting. One was the shared memories of the World War II. Not here anymore. There was a study being recently done in Germany, and it appeared that one third of the German kids, 16 year old, believed that human rights were equally well protected uh, during the Hitler period, Federal Republic, and the GDR. Simply the end of history meant also that nobody is interested in history anymore. So this type of a shared experience does not, does not exist. It does not mean that there is any nostalgia for this period. It simply means that it's not enough to keep the project together. The second was the geopolitical rationale, external threat. And to be honest, when the conflict in uh, Eastern Ukraine started, I do believe that many in Europe believed, listen, it's very bad, but on the other side, this is going to give certain type of a consolidation. It didn't. Uh, paradoxically, Soviet Union has the capacity to consolidate and to unite Europe, Putin's Russia, as ugly as it is, basically much more has the capacity to split Europe. Because basically nobody perceives Putin Russia as a threat to their way of life. There are countries that feel threatened, Poland being one of them. For Italians and Spaniards and others, basically just discussions of this does not make much sense. And then you have the prosperity argument, which was basically always the Junkers of this world argument, which said it is the prosperity that legitimizes the union. Uh, but this is where the financial crisis made a huge difference. Now more than 60% of Europeans believe that their kids are going to have life in economic terms, which is going to be worse than their own. I'm saying all this because, paradoxically, the unity of the European Union, much more is going to come from the fact that we're going to realize that nevertheless, do we believe in this or that, uh, there is no way to simply turn into the nation states. Not because it's bad, but because basically there is nothing to be turned to. Uh, look to the level of how our economies look like. The level of integration went so far that basically, on rhetorical level, we can discuss as much as we want about returning to the sovereign state, but there is no sovereign states around, with the exception probably of the United States, China, and some of the big entities, which is a continent type of countries. And as a result of it, I do believe now we are much more living and struggling with the different illusion. We don't like the status quo, but we cannot simply figure out how the future can look like. And here comes the problem of differences. I do believe that one of the biggest problems of the European political elites is this famous statement, let's not waste for crisis. The idea was, let's use the crisis to impose on people something that they don't like. And it has worked several times. It is not going to work now, 
because one of the major stories that we see is a total mistrust towards the elites. And this mistrust is based, by the way, this is an interesting issue. The elites we have probably are more competent than the elites that we know in history. Why they're so much resented by people? And one of the major reasons they're resented from people is that they have an exit option. These days, when there is a crisis, the elites are not fighting for their country, they're simply leaving. Uh, Greek elites took 30% money, which will equal 30% of their GDP in the first year after the Greek crisis started. So you cannot go to people and say, let's sacrifice, we're in the same boat, when basically some are in the same boat, but other on their yacht and they're going to leave. And as a result of it, I do see a very strong move all over Europe, which is about nationalization, but this time not of an assets, but nationalization of the elites. These days, in many countries, my own also, the fact that you don't speak a foreign language is an advantage to be uh, in a certain way elected in politics because the idea is if he does not speak foreign language, at least there is no a Brussels option for him. Uh, and I do believe this is quite important. People very much want the elites that are going to stay with them in the moment of crisis. And they suspect that the current elites, even when they're competent, even basically when some of them are doing a good job, uh, basically does not share this. Ivan, thank you. I have another quote from Jan. Technocrats dominate policy making while populists dominate politics and Brussels is a lame duck. Jan. This is how it is. <laughs> what can I say? I regret it, <laughs> but uh, nothing else comes to my mind, you know. Uh, you see, Ivan is absolutely right. The legitimacy based on output, which is efficiency, is good when the weather is good. But the weather is not always good. Uh, and, uh, and you need other kind of, of legitimacy to make people stick to the project when, when, when there are bad times and we never develop those things. The, uh, more, my preference would be to opt for citizens' participation. But there are other ways, you know, you can have uh, cultural bonds or, 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 or charismatic leadership, but uh, but none of this is available in the union we have now. And, and the weather was good for many years. But when the weather started to be nasty, uh, things went wrong way. And it was very clear uh, uh, just when, after the collapse of Lehman Brothers, when all governments in Europe decided basically overnight, with little consultation, that those that they are going to bail out one economic sectors over others, you know, which is financial sectors, which screw it, that, that the bill will be fetched by the ordinary taxpayer, and all these banks, which were multinational, uh, will be bailed out on the national principle. And, and if you make that kind of decision, surprise, surprise, you end up that countries which use, like Spain, used to have uh, unemployment uh, more or less like Germany, 12%, now have 25%, and, 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 and Germany has less than five. I, and, and in this situation like this, it's much more difficult to make any deal. Because uh, when they, they are more or less uh, even, it's much easier to negotiate and to reach a compromise. And I don't see how to square the circle. Now, if you, through intergovernmental negotiations, because very simple, just to give you one example, the creditors don't want debtors to tell them what to do with their money. And very simple. But the Greeks voted about Well, exactly. And, and then they, in of a course, referendum, introduced a referendum in Greece, is, uh, you know, the, the outcome. Now, the only way to, to get out of the circle is to, to change certain principles of integration. The one principle is that states have monopoly on integration. You know, EU is monopolized by nation states. I just came from Amsterdam, where the so-called union signed with cities, so-called Amsterdam Pact. For the first time, cities, European cities were recognized as an actor by the EU. 
they didn't, they were just recognized. They didn't get any access to, to, to decisions or resources. But it was historical luck, but one asked yourself on which planet we are living. Because if you would go to any conference dealing with innovation, dealing with growth, dealing with uh, solving uh, issues of, 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 of pollution, of, 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 of migration, cities are prime actors. Mega cities generate 80% of our growth. They, they are where these old migrants are ending up. You know, and they look daily in pragmatic way for solutions. And you could go to other fields, you know, you go to the, to, to the discussion of climate change. States are important, but so, but so are NGOs, so are firms which, which push for green technologies, and so on and so on. So the first principle would be, let's abolish monopoly of nation states for integration. The other would be, let's go for functional integration rather than territorial integration, because, you know, functional integration deals basically with issues uh, which, which are, uh, kind of, you cannot apply one size fits all to all issues. You know, I don't never understand why Hungary has so much say, should have so much say in the maritime traffic as Italy, for instance, and, 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 and why the policies in human rights should be the same as in competition law. And then you go for two other principles, decentralization, flexibility, and so Now, I don't want to say that my principle of, of reform, my, my sort of guideline for reform is perfect. But let's have this discussion. Because we cannot have this discussion that, that you know, we, we somehow have one summit after another trying to solve one serious issues, which is not easy to solve, like, like, uh, uh, like Ukraine in, summit in Riga like Eurozone crisis, like migration summits, you know, I don't know how many we had. And time and again, we get reassuring tweets, nice pictures of the European Council, and no solution whatsoever. Because if I would ask the public how many of you think that Greece will ever pay their debts, or how many of you think that, that the deal with Turkey has solved the European crisis, and, and what we actually agreed to make Ukraine safe and prosperous in Riga, you know the answer. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, Silvi, with the same question, what, what can we draw upon uh, uh, in thinking about the future of the European Union, uh, basically surviving and prospering? But uh, also, if you could put this into the uh, slightly broader context, because you have this experience of, of, of uh, carefully following what's been unfolding in, in the US with, with Donald Trump, and you have written that signs of defiance toward the old democratic order are so numerous, uh, that the news of Hoffer's first round victory uh, hardly reached the front pages of European newspapers. And you see that in the US, the context uh, has been sort of following the, the events in Europe. What, what, how can we get out of this vicious circle? I don't know. <laughs> Tell me. Uh, <laughs> Short answer. But, oh my God. Uh, let's try. Uh, yes, we are facing a general movement. This is really striking. I mean, it's um, on this side of the Atlantic. We have this rise of populism and nationalism. Uh, but we also have in the US this very, very powerful movement of uh, Trumpism. Uh, and I think, of course, they are different in a way, but the roots uh, and the political systems are different, and we have our own EU um, uh, uh, problem, sources of problems. But generally speaking, in the Western world, we have this incredible anger and and you know rage and uh, anxiety of uh, of middle class and working class so this is something um, which have which has to be very deeply analyzed i think it has an you know the rebellion against the elites which has uh, uh, been mentioned but is always also a very very important factor uh, and in the elites i include 
you know, ourselves, the media, the uh, think tanks, the politicians, uh, universities. Uh, we have to do a better job of addressing this anger and this uh, revolt against us. Um, now, we're here to talk about the EU, so, you know, there's the global problem and then there's the additional specific uh, EU issue. I, I like the comparison with Lehman Brothers and, 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 the, finance, and the, the bank crisis because it's true. I mean, it's too big to fail and it exists. Uh, the European Union exists. It's, we are so closely linked together that there's no going back, I think. I think there, will, there, there is a pause already and there has to be a pause. Um, we have to, you know, take a deep breath and, and, and think about what's going on and what how to, to start uh, again from here. But the big mistake would be just to pause and sit it out, you know, wait until it, it, it gets better and maybe employment uh, um, gets better in France and in some other countries, in Spain and in, in, in some other countries and that Greece gets its uh, debt problem um, solved if it ever does and, you know, and maybe we find uh, other solutions, uh, economic re recipes, whatever. This would be uh, a mistake. We have to take advantage of this very deep, huge crisis to uh, reassess the project, to uh, reassess our relations. You know, there's this, um, there's a French uh, law uh, professor, uh, Mireille delmas Marty. she talks, she says we, we are going from solitary sovereignty, which was the, basically the Westphalian concept, to Solid, solidary sovereignty. And I quite like this concept because um, the EU is the only international organization, a, a pluralistic international organization. You have the UN, you have NATO, you have ASEAN, you have... A, but the EU is unique in, the, in this sense that it uh, is an addition of differences, uh, and it respects the differences of those states. Now, we don't know how to do it very well, and this is part of the problem, but we, together, we have a lot of influence. I mean, look, for instance, at what's happening with the death penalty in the US. The death, the death penalty in the US is uh, in decline, and the Europeans have a big, um, have had a big part in this, because um, this is something that, the, that unites the Europeans. It's, it's a very strong value. We all believe in this. And we have been, I mean, I don't think many people are aware of it, but we have been uh, through, you know, pressing through NGOs, through governments, through parliaments, um, through small citizens associations, we have been putting a lot of pressure on pharmaceutical industry, for instance, not to export those drugs which are used to uh, uh, enforce the death penalty in the US. And, you know, very um, powerful um, uh, grassroots campaign. Uh, climate change is another thing. Uh, you know, the, you can find several examples where the EU as an entity is powerful outside. And um, uh, this is something I think we really have to, to work on. And, and we have to change the narrative. I know narrative is a word I, do, I hate because it's so easy. But uh, we are ter <laughs> we're very good at negatives. We're and terrible at positives. <laughs> and uh, one, if I may, just one more thing. Immigration. Uh, I agree with Ivan. The refugee crisis is a turning point in our uh, modern history in Europe. It's, it's, it's a watershed event. It's very important. And it's a transformative event. Now, uh, what happens, it's a big factor in the division. What happens is that part of Europe is multi-ethnic and has been for already some time. And another part of Europe is totally, has been excluded from this demographic, demographic movement because of history, because it, was, it belonged to the Soviet bloc and, and, and all this. Uh, we in the West, in Western Europe, are unable to uh, communicate to the Central European countries that um, 
the merits of being a multi-ethnic society. We're very good at showing the, the, the failures, and there are failures. We have failed in many respects. We have let ghettos um, um, grow, and we have segregation, and we have discrimination. But we also have, and I'm not being angelic or you know naive, but we also have uh, a lot of positive uh, value of added value of having mixed societies and mix uh, and ethnically mixed and culturally mixed and diverse societies and we have to uh, do a much better job in Western Europe you know the UK Germany France to show uh, the positive aspects of this well certainly true we are much better in communicating how homogeneous identities are better than the multi ethnicity so you can learn something from us, no doubt about it. But uh, yes, uh, we, the question about managing the differences as, as a source of of, uh, of our future uh, in Europe seems to be really one that uh, um, uh, will remain for some time to come. One of the major uh, battlegrounds for the European discussions we we have been seeing, even in this country, new ideas. Uh, we have gone through the period of talking about multiple speeds, tiers, circles. Uh, we have been now thinking about uh, alternative or other centers of coagulation in Europe, um, drawing. Uh, on the bet that the Brexit will uh, prove to be uh, uh, just a, a, a sort of a hysterical um, uh, attempt to escape from a domestic problem. But as uh, Jan said, the way to uh, get out of this binary opposition is also to uh, uh, to venture into uncharted territories of polyphony and functional lines of integration instead of the uh, rationality and the logic which would be driven by the sovereign states already vastly reinforced by the European Union project. Well, having said that, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to open up now for the discussion and your comments, polemics. I can see the gentleman already raising hand so please do uh, introduce yourself so we know to whom we speak yeah Andrzej Kopczyński. Andrzej Kopczyński, uh, my question is as follows. Is the European Union uh, ready for uh, the separation with the Great Britain if Great Britain chooses to go out of the Union? Are there any emergency scenarios, any contingency scenarios? And we have another lady in the audience willing to ask the question, and there's a gentleman over there. My name is Wojciech Pomykała. I am a philosophy professor. Um, I'm a bit surprised by what I've heard so far, because there is a we, we, I have this impression that the uh, European problems are isolated from what is happening all around the globe, especially with the emphasis on the growing role of China. I feel that China, in the nearest time perspective, will determine what is happening around the world, including what is happening within the European Union. Also for that very reason that the European Union is in a deep crisis. It's not only due to structural difficulties, but also due to the fact that uh, uh, the uh, contemporary form of capitalism is going through a serious crisis, both in the United States of America and in the, in the Western uh, European economies. And that is coupled with this dynamic growth of China. Despite the uh, fact that uh, this growth may have stalled recently, but still they have the, the largest uh, uh, growth rate. And over the last 10 years, they maintain 10% uh, growth rate. Um, so that could have an impact on the Central Europe. There is this program 11 plus in China. And that leads to huge investments in this part of Europe. Um, and perhaps that would also have a certain impact on the fate of the European Union. So could you, could you address this issue, please? And we have this lady over there as well. Uh, and now, a word to the uh, right side of the audience. We have Minister Onyszkiewicz um, over there. I have 
question to Ivan Krastev mostly on referenda, because you said that it's going to be suicide for EU, but isn't that a sort of vicious circle? I mean, one of the reasons why EU lost hearts of minds of people was the crisis of democracy. And you know, during Euro crisis, people increasingly felt that decisions are being made behind their back by institutions which are undemocratic and unaccountable. So, you know, not giving people the ability to exercise their democratic uh, right to vote on are they actually want to be in EU, was it, wouldn't that make them vote populists who will undermine EU um, anyway? So isn't that, you know, the choice between two bad, um, bad alternatives? And isn't that the same like with the refugee crisis because there's a choice between compromising European values and compromising European welfare state? Uh, uh, Euro crisis versus a choice between satisfying the debtors' countries and satisfying the countries which are in debt. So you said that you know there is no way back, but is there a way forward? Bardzo pani dziękuję i pan minister Anuszkiewicz. Well, first one comment. In, the, in debates about European Union, very often there is kind of a distinction made between the old EU member states and the new member states, basically former communist countries. But there is another group of states which joined the European Union before this enlargement involving us. The countries which, with, which also had certain problems with democracy. I'm talking about Spain, Portugal, well, Greece to some extent. To what extent these countries somehow and entering the, uh, entering these countries to European Union really created sort of a change in European Union? But the, the other question is this, and uh, somebody already asked what uh, will happen if Great Britain will leave European Union. My question is what will happen if Great Britain will remain in European Union, taking into account the fact that now, according to the a sort of agreement between European Union and, and Great Britain, the whole concept of ever increasing integration of European Union is abandoned. Uh, so what does that mean? And would, would that mean that really Europe, European Union will sort of drift towards multi-speed and you know with certain di diversification, internal diversification. We already have one club, that's Euro Club. But is there a possibility that there will be sort of a hardcore or several sort of groupings inside European Union with different speeds? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister. Um, and uh, I will go back to the gentleman who want to ask the question in a moment. But first, let's go back to the panelists. Uh, I think that on the UK, I would ask Jan actually to comment on the fallback option and the plan B uh, for the UK referendum if it goes badly. And then obviously the other side, which Minister Onuskiewicz has just asked, what happens in, in, if, if the, the, the result is remain? Is this going to wipe out at least for some time the European question out of the public discourse and political life in the UK? Quite opposite, or would that basically create a situation where these appetites for the uh, non-euro, pre-euro center of coagulation based on the platform which Cameron has received from, from the EU actually would create a, a, a cycle of applies or other center, yeah. If you could grab a microphone, yeah. Cameron has called this referendum to, uh, to basically um, unite his, his party over Europe. We know now that his party is more divided than ever. We know that he may lose his job, even if he wins this referendum, and, and, and Great Britain may lose Scotland. Uh, um, doesn't look to me like a, a very uh, intelligent uh, way to, to, to achieve your goal. And basically, there is no evidence that the deal he negotiated with the EU uh, has changed mind of any undecided voters in Britain. But there is obviously evidence showing that uh, in a number of countries already, uh, people think, well, if Britain can have those special relationships, why cannot we have it too? You know, in Austria, I just heard uh, 
why shouldn't we have also these migrants with no rights to, 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 to certain benefits? In Poland, we know, government says we don't want the EU to tell us anything about constitutional court, and so on and so on. So uh, the damage has already been done, whatever happens. And, and I don't think the EU has any plan B. They never, for the very simple reason, partly because they are not on speaking terms with each other. <laughs> we have to understand <laughs> this. This, these leaders hardly ever talk oh. to each other. And I can, you know, don't have time now to go into details, but I have evidence for this. But partly also that, of course, they, you know, they, if, if they would tell now that we they see a way out of this, then, then this would strengthen the exit uh, uh, vote uh, group. And so they say, no, no, this will be hardball. But this was never like this in the history. You always negotiated partly uh, because of the nature of the exercise and partly because the very fact that, that the English will vote, uh, the, the British will vote um, out, it doesn't mean the, the, the world ends. I mean, there is still trade relationship to sort out. Number of firms are dependent, number of citizens are dependent on mutual arrangements. And, uh, and it will be all messy, but this is how it is. Uh, uh, what can I say? Uh, okay, the EU and the outer world question goes to Sylvie, obviously, because of her extensive knowledge of Southeast Asia and understanding of the China dynamics, and also because of the streets of Paris and, and squares of Paris this, these days and, and the capitalism. The flooding, you mean? <laughs> <laughs> how these big things uh, actually impinge upon, upon our discussions now about how um, to restore the, the integration process. Yeah, no, China, you're absolutely right to point out the role of China because it's, it is also one of the factors um, of this big anxiety um, in, in, in the developed world. Um, the, the workers basically in America and in Europe have the feelings that they have been, of course, the, uh, lots of jobs have been lost, um, but they haven't been lost for everybody. They, you know, uh, China and other emerging countries have made huge gains out of this globalization. That's, you know, figures prove it. Um, uh, I don't know how many millions of uh, or hundreds of millions of Chinese uh, have now joined the ranks of the middle class, and um, you know, in a way, it's it's the oversimplification is to say that our loss is is their gain, but or their gain is our loss. But it is true that this is a, a, a phenomenon which is uh, impacting, um, which has a lot of impact on on, on Europe. Now uh, we see the negative consequences. We don't see the positive consequences, which is, of course, the growth of uh, the economic growth in China has already uh, has also um, um, been a factor in in um, in our economies and a positive factor, and um, you know, and the tr growth of trade and everything. Now. The, the argument for you in favor of Europe in this is that what is uh, even Germany with its 80 million inhabitants and, and its very big GDP alone, what does it weigh alone uh, in front of China? So not mentioning uh, Italy, Poland, Latvia, you know. Uh, this is really a very, I think China is one of the most powerful arguments for Europe that you have to be together, you have to be a block also to be able to deal with China. It's 500 million um, consumers. It's a single market. So it's the only way you can really be a counterweight or, or, or a partner, an equal partner also with China. 
Now, um, I'll go to Ivan with a question which combines the, the one started with referenda and what uh, Minister uh, Onuskevich was saying about the, the countries, other countries, the older members, but not the founding members necessarily, who also used to have their own problems with democracies. Funnily enough, the countries in the EU, actually, they, they differ in a, in a, alongside the very interesting line. Uh, there are these countries for which the EU actually uh, has always been a kind of a mercantilist decision or the man membership at the countries for which the EU was also a safety haven, uh, a an escape from their own domestic problems. Ortega y Cassette um, uh, wrote about Spain, that Spain was a problem, Europe was a solution. Uh, Ivan, the question goes to you. Thank you very much. Uh, th this, the critical issue, and I'll try to be slightly blunt to make at least where I stand. Uh, first of all, uh, there is, people said there is a demand for participation. Unfortunately, there is no empirical evidence for this. You have a proliferation of a referendum on which people do not vote. Do you know how many voted on the Dutch referendum on the Ukraine? 22%. So paradoxically, more and more, the referendum is becoming an instrument for the elite to try to get and to solve some of their problems on the national level than getting anything else. And it's not by accident what we are talking about, uh, also Cameron's strategy. Why this is happening? Because the crisis of democracy is taking place mainly on the level of the nation state. Listen, we used to talk about populism and so on, and we talk as if we're talking about certain type of a pathological phenomenon that is going to disappear. I could be wrong. I do believe we see a major realignment of our party systems. Uh, you have these uh, uh, elections, presidential elections in Austria. Uh, and what is very interesting to see is that the country is divided, but the country is divided in a very consistent way. The left-right division does not work anymore. Workers very much moved to the far right because the major discussion and the major clash now is about internationalists who believe that opening globalization in its cultural, political, and social things are much more working for them. And others, basically it's very much clash between people, the spirit of the place and the spirit of the time. These are the two parties that are basically going together. This kind of a voters has a very clear profile. Better educated, living in the urban areas, by the way, mo mainly women, are much more ready to go with the globalization option. And on the other side, rural population, but also some of uh, the workers and others, they do believe that nation states should give them not simply welfare benefits, they're asking for certain level of social cohesion and identity. You can see this in the United States, it's very much the profile of the Trump voters on the other side. If this is the case, what we are seeing all over Europe is that European Union was based not simply on democracies, but on a certain type of a liberal democracies that have been born during the Cold War and that have certain characteristics. First, they have been very much about left-right divide. Secondly, foreign policy was out of the electoral politics. Helmut Schmidt used to say our relations with the United States are too important to be left to the voters. What happened with the European Union during the last 10 years is that we took economic policies out of the electoral politics. Uh, we constitutionalized budget deficit. So from this point of view, what remained in politics now is identity, and by the way, foreign policy is a type of uh, uh, identity politics. If this is the case, uh, my problem with the referendum is not simply that the referendum can give you decent bad results here and there. Elections can do the same. The major problem is that European Union cannot be union of referenda because the referenda does not negotiate with each other. In a certain way, what the referendum decision is doing, it is taking all the space for negotiations out of the European Union space. So imagine that today, every country that wants basically to get out of a certain type of a common policy decides to have a referendum on this. Uh, uh, Sylvie was talking about death penalty. Listen, if there are going to be a referendum on death penalty in Bulgaria, believe me that 70% are going to vote yes. And the same was for Hungary, and by the way, Viktor Orban have been discussing this. So from this point of view, I do believe that there were certain type of a consensuses that work very strong on a certain level, and they're highly problematized uh, because the level of representation 
representation and the level of uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, participations are not the same. One of the interesting phenomena, and basically, at least for me, this is very interesting. All over Europe, you see populations that are very mistrustful to politicians, to all politicians. At the same time, they're ready to give power to a certain power party or a certain political leader, even to go against the separation of powers, because for them, this is the only way to believe to have some accountability, because they started to believe that separation of power is an alibi for the elites to explain what they cannot do. And paradoxically, we have a much more demand for somebody to get responsibility than the demand on the side of the people to decide on their own. The idea that people want to decide on their own, and this is why we're going to have a referendum on everything, is much more an elite strategy to get out of responsibility than, in my view, a genuine demand. And my last point is to believe that the democratic legitimacy in the European Union, which is not a state, can be the same as the democratic legitimacy in the nation states. This is the biggest fallacy, and in my view, also intellectual failure uh, of the political class. Uh, the idea that you're going to elect directly the president of the European Union between people who do not share common language, do not basically share common understanding of issues, and this is going to make the European Union legitimate. Uh, I find this good for a conference. I don't find it good for anything. And by the way, the best description of a collapse of a multinational empire is, of course, not in the political science literature. It is in fiction. In Radetzky March, uh, 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 Philip Roth was telling the following moment, and this I do believe it's important because it gives you the feeling. So you have a garrison somewhere on the borders of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. It's a 1914. Habsburg officers were the most loyal part of the empire. And then there comes a telegram about the assassination of Archiduk Franz Ferdinand. And at this moment, one of the Hungarian officers starts speaking Hungarian to his colleagues. And all others become nervous. And a Slovene officer, who cannot understand what Hungarians are talking about, said, please, let's speak German only. I do believe that the biggest problem is that in time of crisis, everybody goes in his national debates, in his national language, and the idea, let's speak German only, does not work. Thank you, Ivan. Uh, two more questions, which we promised to the gentleman sitting on the right-hand side here. I think you could... Uh... <coughs> Uh, Warsaw the University of Technology, and I'd like to ask a concrete question. Do you see any concrete example of success for the EU, a success that could be achieved in order to build the trust of people? For example, I know that recently we had the president of the uh, um, uh, European Parliament on Cyprus, and resulting from this visit uh, is, you know, he, he, he would like to present as his success the unification of Cyprus, which is not possible, of course. Um, uh, um, could there be a tangible success for the EU uh, to achieve that could be that could be the beginning of rebuilding the trust in uh, the European Union? The second thing, the founding states. I think uh, the largest mobilization um, uh, was associated with economic and currency union. That was the, the main driver. Uh, Italy wanted very much to be part of the EU as uh, the founding state. The, uh, the Spaniards wanted to prove that they are like the founding states. They were doing their best. And uh, towards the finish of my question, it is disappointing for me to see the, the defense of the Schengen zone, because it would seem that, that Schengen has a strong fundamentals, uh, economic fundamentals, because uh, trade benefits from it, and the society's benefits for the citizens from benefit from it. But there seems not to be too much pressure on the governments to defend Schengen. Now the microphone goes to another person, and then there will be a following question after this speaker. Stanislav. Stasburger. A question about 
the negative uh, phenomena, nationalism, the national focus type of thinking, but we have reverse phenomena as well. For example, Podemos in Spain, uh, who are trying to create a new narrative, not only for the regions in Spain, but also for entire Europe. But also, we have phenomena like um, the shifts within political uh, identification. Uh, uh, the, the Greens becoming allies of uh, uh, the uh, uh, Christian Democrats in Germany and other examples. So could these be rays of hope or some good signs, do you think? Uh, and would you be able to elaborate on this? Do you see uh, positive examples and where particularly do you see such examples? Recently in Warsaw, there was an economic advisor from uh, Cadiz in Spain, uh, from Podemos, and he, uh, he says there's huge power in Spain resulting from that movement, Podemos. And uh, also, um, this uh, leads uh, the, 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 the Spain, uh, the Spanish experience and the Spanish uh, movement to um, sometimes confront with the institution of the EU, but uh, his conclusion was that sometimes that the compromise needs to be found in order to push things forward. One more question. Um, I would like to thank you for this debate, which was really uh, very, very interesting. Especially, I would like to um, thank Mr. Krasov for his last intervention, because I think it goes to the core of, of the problem, that we have uh, right now very dif differentiated societies. Uh, some uh, some part, parts of them are more internationalized and uh, participate more in the, in the global economy, and others are, um, are less, let's say, um, uh, internationalized and um, have uh, worse access to, 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 to capital also. And it goes together with uh, the um, growth of inequality uh, in, in our uh, uh, states, which, are, which, which the whole economic model of, uh, is, is, is changing in the, in, the global, in the global economy. So, um, uh, as you said, uh, those uh, who um, uh, feel excluded, they turn to, to nationalism, to uh, national politics as a solution, because this is the only solution that they see. They have no other way to um, question the model. Um, and um, um, I, let me just say that um, what is the solution? Uh, Mr. Jelonka said that we could uh, think about uh, uh, giving more power, let's say, to the cities uh, or to companies or to NGOs. But is this just a way of giving more power to the capital? Because if you, if you give more power to, to the cities, it, 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 it means that you give more power to this part of society which is more inter, uh, internationalized, more implicated in the global economy. Uh, and how to solve it with, with the democracy? I mean, it would, it would be uh, undemocratic and it wouldn't solve the, the, the problem with the uh, inputs, let's say, uh, legitim legitimacy. Um, and another thing Mr. Jelanka said was about functional integration. Uh, how do you see the, the possibility of, of uh, because I, I translate it like into a, a flexible union. And I think that flexible union might be very dangerous for, uh, because it creates uh, divides between, uh, between uh, European countries. So how, what do you think about that? Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, as time is drawing to a close for our session, what I would do now, I would ask our guest panelists for their last interventions, and if you could address the questions which you were raised and directed at you, and let me remind you, the first one was about low-hanging fruits for the EU, which we could actually grab um, and try to, to create some sort of a trust out of them. Then there was the question of uh, new political alliances in Europe, and then Podemos was mentioned. And let me remind you that it's not only Podemos, but there are things happening also in the mainstream in Austria and France and many other countries. Uh, Sylvie alluded to this earlier. And then the third question was about 
a completely new dimension. How does it basically shed the light on the on the relationship between those who basically uh, hold the capital and those who sell their um, work? And then obviously the uh, notion of flexibility of the EU within this functional polyphonic um, uh, rationality. I think I'll start with Sylvie first. Um. Low hanging fruit, uh, okay. if, there, if there are any. Uh, well, you quoted Schengen. Schengen is a huge uh, achievement, and of course, it is uh, under threat now because of the terrorism and refugee crisis. But um, it's, it's again, it's something, you know, when we're talking about not going back, uh, closing all borders is going to have immense consequences and I think the citizens of EU when they realize this may maybe you know uh, will understand what is uh, what is at stake um, single market isn't this an achievement the single market it's it's a huge achievement and it exists um, Eurozone is not an achievement for everybody, and it's of obviously very much criticized. But outside, uh, you should hear you should hear uh, people in Asia, for instance, uh, countries, uh, members of ASEAN. They are in awe about the eurozone. They think, how did you achieve this? You know, this is um, we again something we only see the uh, negative aspects, but we don't see. Um, the, the historical and the economic achievements of this. Erasmus. <laughs> Erasmus is very popular. It's, of course, it only affects a minority of citizens. It's, it's a small percentage, but it's, it's one example of a very, very popular creation of the EU. And I will quote another thing, which is environment. You know, there, there, there's. I don't. I don't. I cannot go into details. But in uh, in in this uh, field, in the field of environment, and normative, the normative power of of the EU has been quite effective. I think. Yeah, your last intervention. I just want to say that the good news is based. First of all, there is no one simple trick. To, to solve complex problems. And if somebody comes with a, you know, with simple in, particular institutional solutions for complex cultural, historical problems, then, then be wary, I would tell you. Uh, the second thing is that if, if institutions become, formal institutions become dysfunctional, the informal politics takes place. And, and it is not always bad news. People just take care in different capacities and, and places. Uh, they, they, they take care of things because uh, they have to go along with their lives. And, 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 and we see this, for instance, they, they cannot reach agreement on, on, on admitting refugees, and, and yet there are a number of families or parochias who, who take them and give them shelter and help them in different ways. And, and and even in, in, in such complex, you know, like issues like capitalist democracy, I agree with, with, with all those who, who emphasize the social dimension here. I don't know how much you was helpful in, in this respect. But in democracy, you see, there are various ways to, to organize it. One is to bring citizens closer to, to the center. And another is just to disperse power. Uh, so, so here where flexibility and decentralization works, you bring, you know, brings power closer to citizens and you disperse power. You don't have to have everything run from one uh, center because, uh, you know, the, the, the area you govern is too complex for that. So what I want to say is we in Europe are rich and we are not at war with each other. What, what we need to have is to have a bit of imagination and courage to move things forward. And, and let's have this discussion and press our elites to, to, to do what they are expected to do. To, to, you know, to, to come with the goodies and we will see how well they are doing. But uh, my view is very simple. 
we will work with each other one way or another, preferably with the EU, and if not, uh, without. Ivan. Thank you very much. Uh, let's start with uh, Chinese. When they have a problem, they start rereading old books. Uh, so uh, this is on the idea of the alternative and how it can work. Machiavelli used to say that uh, basically for every state and for every prince, there is a good time and a bad time. And you cannot avoid the bad time. The difference between the good ruler and the bad ruler is that the good ruler succeeds to accumulate enough loyalty and political capital to survive the bad times. So from this point of view, the very survival of the European Union is going to be a source of legitimacy. Strangely enough, going through a crisis and basically remaining, uh, uh, surviving, is giving you legitimacy because uh, the capacity to deal resilience is a very important source of legitimacy. And here comes the idea of the realignment. I very much agree with you. Uh, the Christian Democrat, the Green story, is very telling. By the way, this is the classical idea how a new internationalist alliance comes from. You have, on one level, some of the businesses, by the way, also some of the universalism coming from the Catholic Church and others, together with this type of a new generation and different type of a post-national attitudes very much coming from the far left and uh, things like this. Uh, and this is going to be an interesting thing to happen. Unfortunately, this is not what we're seeing in Central and Eastern Europe. Exactly for the fact that I was talking that we are coming from a type of internationalist regime, you do not have politically strong type of a coalition like this. Business, some of our businesses basically are starting to become protectionists because they do believe that in the 1990s, uh, foreign investors got too much. Uh, some of our much more internationalized part of the younger generation are not here anymore because part of internationalization was very much also leaving the country. Uh, and I do believe this is going to work very different in different places. Uh, just after the crisis, you remember, there was this peak of uh, protest movements. And it is interesting, because then the idea was, it's going to be no political party, no, it's going to be network, it's going to be horizontal. But if you look to Podemos, Podemos is one of the most classically structured political parties with a very strong leaders. So paradoxically, I do believe charismatic figures are going to play much more role in this realignment than social science literature basically is telling us it will be. Because this is exactly what charismatic leader is about. He brings position which till yesterday looks totally inconsistent. One of the interesting uh, effect of the post-Cold War period, and this is my last point, is that because we didn't have a political alternative, we try to moralize any differences. Uh, anybody basically whom we don't like was perceived very much as immoral. And this highly moralizing language, very typical for the EU, very typical for the United States, brought up an interesting phenomenon. Look at those charismatic figures. Donald Trump. Why basically people are going to trust somebody like Trump? Because he's openly cynical. It appears that only people who said, I'm a cynic, is worth trusting. And this is the result of this over-moralization of the previous period. In a certain way, only people who said, I'm bad, I'm there about myself, I'm totally egoistic, uh, that people said, listen, he's saying the truth. Of course, this type of leaders are going to be very difficult uh, to come and to create any community of their own, because in a certain way, this is, uh, uh, this is uh, a phenomenon that uh, cannot last much, but it is going to be political leaders, much more than any type of a bigger structural things that are going to affect the crisis of the European Union, especially on the national level. And from this point of view, it's really very, very last point. The biggest problem for me when I see what's happening is not so much the rise of the populist parties, but why the liberal opposition is so ineffective. And there is something here. And I do believe it is a question to be asked. Uh, in order to understand the nature of the crisis, it is very much this. And I do believe that the fact that many of these liberal oppositions want Brussels to solve for them a political problems which are national of their character is basically ha having a double negative effect. They're delegitimizing these parties and also they're delegitimizing Brussels. Ivan, bardzo dziękuję. Uh,
Proszę Państwa, jak mawiam Anglicy, time is up. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, time is up. I truly regret that I cannot ask you to ask further uh, questions. I wanted to give you a short summary, but I just want to say probably one sentence or two sentences. One is a word of warning. Ivan wrote a year ago something that has accompanied me for at least several months when I have been observing the events in Poland. And he wrote, and I will do a site translation, large projects don't fail from the periphery. This integration always starts at the center. It begins when the winners start to feel that they are starting to be losers in the project. And Poland, if Poland, it is Poland that is a significant country for Europe. And if Poland, a country perceived as one of the biggest winners of the European integration, if Poland starts to have doubts over the European project, then other countries, including Germany, will have the same doubts and they will question the European projects as well and I, 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 I hope and I wish that this prophecy of Ivan's will not come true and that the Germans will not question and that the, 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 the British will not question that. <laughs> Uh, towards the very end. Where are the sources of hope for the European project? Throughout this panel, what I heard was one very important thing. What we are seeing right now is not a collapse, it's not a failure. That actually it uh, resembles disintegration. And what springs to my mind is a concept that I'd like to borrow from psychiatrist, a Polish psychiatrist, the Professor Kempinski, a positive disintegration, the notion of positive disintegration. And what he meant is that a certain model of my of integration and balance in emotional and psychological structure has to end, has to finish in order to enable the person to integrate, reintegrate at a better, more stable level. And let us hope that this positive disintegration, this is the positive disintegration that we are seeing right now. And that's the one that I have just mentioned. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Uh, and I'm very sorry for the slight delay. And uh, please give a round of applause for this magnificent uh, conversation that we have said. Uh, um, Sylvie Kaufmann, Jan Zielonka, Ivan Krastev, thank you very much.